Hello, welcome back to Sharks Happen. My name is Hal, I'm your host, going over shark attacks from the 1900s till present, mostly large sharks, and we're gonna get started over at Atlantic Dunes Municipal Beach, which is at Delray Beach in Florida. The date is June 9th of 1999. Ryan Wellborn is five years old and he is out it doesn't say how far from shore, but he's in two feet of water, so he's probably not far from shore. It sounds like his mother is close to him, on probably just with her feet in the water or maybe even up on the beach, because she's not right next to him when this takes place. He's in two feet of water, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. He's got other kids around him and no other kids can see anything approaching and they're in the shallows, and all of a sudden he starts screaming, uh, get it off me, and he's smacking down by his leg. Uh, by his left leg actually and his mother just quickly goes out in the water picks him up out of the water and takes him to the beach um, he's bleeding from his left leg from a, a three inch gash to the back of the thigh uh, back of the calf and that the back of the calf wound goes all the way to the bone and then his left shin also had a bite mark to it so it sounds like uh, unless that's the front of the clamp it sounds like he was bitten twice by the shark a uh, very small shark it has to be. Um, one of the kids that were in the water with him said that I was very close to him. We didn't see anything in the water. It must have been a small shark. Uh, by the wound that he was given, it was assumed that it would either be a small spinner shark or a small black tip shark. Um, so he's taken out the lifeguards. They go ahead and give him first aid. He's taken in and sewn up and um, he goes ahead and survives this attack from a small shark. Not going to keep it in the files, but I wanted to go over it seeing as, um, you know, it sounds like it was probably a three foot shark or smaller and still went down to the bone. I know it's a child, a five year old, but ugh, that's some, that's some brutal, uh, uh, wound from a small shark and you know small sharks they can't kill you they usually don't kill you on their own not that these wounds are, are anything you know to laugh at it i still wouldn't want to be in the water with a small shark biting on me and have something bite me down to the bone anywhere i mean that's just not my thing so uh that's our attack on ryan Wilburn, and we'll move on now we head over to coletta malpaman cove which is in mexico the date on this is september 11th of 1984 uh, Harry Ingram, he is 37 years old and he is part of a group of divers. There's 25 other divers there. He and two other partner, dive partners are doing some spear fishing. He's down in the water for about 20 minutes and him and his partner don't see anything. So they leave their third partner out there and the two of them return to the boat. Now they get back to the boat and now in the meantime, their buddy, their other dive partner had saw a large yellowfin tuna, which is what they're after. He shot it, successful shot, and now this fish is dragging him about 60 to 80 feet on the surface of the water. So his friends can see that he's got a fish and is dragging him along and the line snapped on him and that fish got away. So the two, Harry Ingram and his other dive partner that was spearfishing with the, the third man that just lost his fish, they get back in the water, I'm sure thinking, all right, the fish are here, we're gonna go ahead and fish. Uh, they go out and they're, they're swimming along and they locate uh, a bunch of tuna and his buddy, uh, not Harry, but the other guy shoots one of the tuna and it takes off about 50 yards before the line goes suddenly slack. So Harry and the dive partner, they're swimming through the water and they eventually come up to a cloud of blood that's probably about, they said about 10 feet in diameter and three meters in diameter. So they run into this cloud of blood. They pretty much know that some shark, probably a great white, has taken their fish right off of the, right off of the hook. So they're now snorkeling at the top of the surface. Uh, Harry is at the surface and he's looking down. He's in about 40 feet of water. There's a drop off to about 100 feet just away from there. He is 330 yards from shore, a good 25 yards from the boat, and he looks down in the water as he's snorkeling and he sees a great white down just a few meters above the, the seafloor. So it's about 30 meters down from where he is, but it sounds like it's quite a ways behind him. So it's down and behind him. He yells a warning to all the other uh, divers, get, get out of the water, there's a shark. He turns to do a 180 and now he's keeping his eye on the shark. But he notices that the shark turns its, turns its body a little bit. Um, it sounds like it was going away from him, but it turned its body and rolled its eye up so he could see that the shark was looking at him. Now he yells another warning to everybody to get out of the water, looks back at the shark, and it starts making a beeline at him. It's not this 
upward thing. It's coming up at a 20 degree angle, not, not this straight up thing that, that they probably do with seals and sea lions when they're in, in, you know, going after those. It's coming up at 20 degrees. And as soon as it gets about 10 yards, 10 feet away, about three yards, he goes ahead and shoots his spear and it lands into the shark's head. So he connects with the shark's head. But this is a big shark and it came up and it had turned to the side when it got shot. But it kept coming at him and hit him so hard it knocked him at least three feet out of the water and two feet back in the other direction. And both of them landed in the water. The shark turned and just swam off. He ends up getting back to the boat. All his wounds ended up being was a bruise to the interior of the arm. It's, they said they think that it's the spear gun that when the shark hit him, it knocked the spear gun into his arm, kind of like a recoil would if you've ever shot a, you know, a shotgun or any, any kind of thing like that. So um, he has a bruise, like a recoil bruise and nothing more from getting blasted out of the water from a shark that who knows what it was going to do when it was coming up. Um, you know, you, you don't know. I don't think that it was, I think it was more territorial. <laughs> like he said, he saw it looking up at him. Well, I probably didn't want him there. Um, no way to tell. Um, this is one of those 50% of the time that Baldridge said that weapons actually work. Uh, he probably would have been bitten if he didn't shoot it in the head. He still got blasted out of the water, but it's a lot better than having to go to the hospital, go through all the, the sutures, and sometimes go through physical therapy. So that's our attack on Harry Ingram. Uh, no injury, an attack, and of course not an attempt to predate. Okay, now we're going to go over to Westbrook Beach, and that is in South Africa. The date, December 26th of 2015. Grant Wardell, he is doing some kayak fishing with his brother, and they don't give much information as far as distance from shore or about what time it is. They said this is in the morning. Uh, they're probably near... Westbrook Beach when this incident takes place, but a great white shark decides it's going to breach and it breaches and Grant said that he the shark barely missed his nose as it breached and kind of went by him and hit the front of the, the kayak and it looks like there's bite marks on the front of the kayak uh, from the picture that I've seen and the motion of it hitting the boat kayak knocks Grant right into the water. So now Grant's in the water. On his way to the water, or right when he hit the water, he said he could see the bright white belly of this shark, but he doesn't remember being in the water. Uh, very quickly, that, that kayak's overturned. Very quickly, he climbs himself up on top of the kayak. Now his brother is just 10 feet away in his kayak, just a few yards away. And he goes over and he's keeping an eye out for the shark and Grant's now got to get in the water and flip that kayak over, which he does. He gets in the water, flips the kayak over, and gets back in it. Now the two of them are going to make their way into shore, so they still have their bait that is, that is being dragged behind their kayaks. It sounds like they're trolling, so they got a bait tied off, and they're just trolling around hoping something grabs it. Um, but they could see the shark fin just about five meters behind it, so you're talking 15, 20 feet behind that bait on the way into shore, that shark had followed them in. Didn't want anything to do with the bait, but uh, you know, it was uh, making sure probably that it was getting what it wanted, which was what I think is those kayaks out of the water, at least out of its area. Um, so that's our attack on Grant Wardell. There's no injury in this, uh, thankfully. Uh, a lot of times with kayaks, when the people are knocked in the water, there is no injury except for usually when they get, you know, bump the side of the kayak when they go in. So they end up with bruising, maybe sometimes a little duck cut from something, but it's usually not the shark. Uh, so that's our story of Grant Wardell on, a, on an attack on kayak fishermen. Okay, now we head over to Aredi Beach, which is on South Island, New Zealand, and the date is December 31st of 1999. Um, this attack involved three people, uh, sounds like three teenagers, one of them is Jennifer McDowell, and she was in the water with some friends swimming and she was bitten in the arm by a shark and it ended up biting through her flexor muscle. She needed 60 stitches to survive. They said this was a broad nose seven gill shark that bit her. And the issue here is another gentleman was bit, Tim Wild, he is 16 years old. He was on the same beach he was surfing at the time and he was bitten in the leg and he ended up with six puncture wounds, I believe it is, to the back of his leg. but. Um, they didn't need to hospitalize him. He was treated on an outpatient basis, probably, you know, bandaged it up and gave him antibiotics for the, to fight infection. And then there was a third girl, 
Um, I don't think any of these three are at the beach with each other, which is odd that it's reported the way that it is. Um, they're kind of reported in three different attacks, but they're mentioned in all three of the attacks like it's the same attack. So uh, the shark seems to be the same though. Tim also was bitten by a, a broad-nosed seven-gill shark. And then another girl that was in the water had her hand cut. Now, uh, that's all it says is that her hand was cut. Um, the problem with this story is I can only find it like when, when you look up Tim Wilde or Jennifer McDowell. That Tim Wilde usually pops up in the bottom of stories like recaps of past attacks to where I can't get to the actual reporting back when it happened to be able to sort out times, distances, anything like that. So right now all I can find is like little updates or little, you know, uh, reportings of what had happened in the past at, at certain locations of, of attacks and in that case it would be at that, that beach. So uh, that's our attack on both Jennifer McDowell and Tim Wilde. And we're going to put them down as an attack, not an attempt to predate by a seven gill shark. Okay, now we're going to head over to Cap Hamard, and that is on Reunion Island. The date, April 12th of 2015. Elio Canestri, he is 13 years old, and he is out doing some surfing with about six or seven other friends. Um, there's not supposed to be anybody in the water due to the likelihood of running into a dangerous shark, yet they're out there doing their surfing. So Elio's out doing surfing and he is knocked off of his board. It's about 50 feet from shore, and then it's just after nine o'clock, and a shark comes up and rams him, knocks him off the board. And now the witnesses said that they saw him being flung around in the water as the shark bit him in the abdomen. So the shark must have bit him in the stomach and tossed him or was thrashing him around. And shortly after that, it took off his right arm and then it took off his right leg before taking him out to sea. A uh, couple reports on who had brought him in. One was that you know his fellow surfers brought him in, not if a shark had taken him out to sea. I don't see that they were going to get out to where he is. Um, another report is that a boat was launched very quickly and got over to him, pulled him up out of the water. That's the one I think is likely, and I think it's likely that if you know if Elio had to wait for his friends to get out there, there would be no body. Um, at all because he would have probably been completely consumed but seeing as sounds like that boat got there very fast and and it was able to stop the the you know the consuming from being finished and they were able to get the rest of his remains he ended up passing away from his wounds um, he said that he wouldn't go in the water. He left a note for his mother, I guess, that he would not be going in the water to surf if there weren't spotters out there, if people weren't looking for sharks. So she ends up seeing this note and her son ends up being killed out there in the water by a shark. The very thing he says he ain't going to go in there unless that there's spotters. Well, there wasn't spotters. It sounds like he might have been doing, um, taking a lesson, a surfing lesson out there. Who's running surfing lessons where you're not supposed to be? I mean, Shouldn't we just start obeying people that say, hey, it's too dangerous to go into that water? Screw your sport, stay alive. Um, makes no sense to me. You surfers, I mean, where, you, where you're told that you might be attacked and you're going in there and then somebody ends up getting killed. That's just makes no sense at all to me. Um, common sense is lacking big time in that situation. We're gonna put this down as an attack and an attempt to predate. We do not know what kind of shark. Um, I don't even want to speculate. I mean, it could be bull, tiger, great white. Um, all of them will do that to you, but, you know, it's just a terrible situation where the shark comes up and grabs you like that and then just goes ahead and starts chewing on you. Um, you know, I wouldn't call that the normal territorial attack on a board, but I'm not sure this was a great white either. So that's the story of 13-year-old Elio. Okay, now before we get into our final segment of the show, um, it's not a normal segment. This is just a man trying to go to a woman into being as dumb as a man, and he gets his way. Um, so we'll get into that shortly. I wanted to go over two things. I went ahead and saw uh, just, I think it's a new clip that says, it, I think it, the title of it was Great Whites Will Start Eating People or Great Whites Are Going to Start Eating People. Sky News Australia it was a clip on YouTube that I'd watched on that and they had a gentleman on there talking about the numbers of sharks. Uh, they say it's plague proportions in the waters there for great whites and for sharks in general. And I, I, I 
I have to say, there's a huge increase in sharks in the water just by where I fish, um, down in the Keys, where I'm going to head again in about another 10 days. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you know, um, the guy brings up a really good point, though, wondering who went ahead and made these sharks endangered. Um, he's probably wondering, they were only doing recreational fishing for great whites. They weren't doing finning of great whites, and if they were, it's one or two here and there. There's no money in finning great whites because they're solitary creatures. They're, they're not, you notice that they were being taken, um, but I haven't seen a lot of fins of great whites by finners in those photos. They're usually small fins, um, so I don't think that the finners were around doing that. I don't know that there was any kind of a commercial um, fishing going on for the great whites and I definitely um, know that these people that are out there fishing like uh, Frank Mundus and, uh, and probably Vic Hesklop and, and just about all of them, they're catching large, they're trying to catch the largest shark they can. So they're catching a lot of sharks and some of them probably like Mundus and kept smaller ones than they normally would and probably Vic kept a bunch of them smaller. But most people that are out there are trying to catch a record size white on a rod and reel, set themselves a record. That's what those are for. That's what sport fishing does. So, uh, you know, I don't know who came up with that these things were endangered anyway. People talk about, oh, well, Jaws. Well, when do you remember seeing a news clipping of people out there, uh, you know, going to town on Great Whites? I have never seen it myself. I look for everything shark. I've never seen a story from 75 on where people were out indiscriminately killing Great Whites yet we haven't protected. And I have a theory on this and I have to check into books back before Jaws. But uh, just by a couple of the books that I have here, these some marine biologists were signing off on just some of the craziest stuff now. This one book I have says, oh yeah, when the shark smells your, get your blood in the water, you're finished. Uh, once you're bleeding, you're gonna be eaten by the shark if it's by there, and especially if the shark bit you, it's definitely gonna finish you off. We know by the few hundred stories we've gone through now that most of the time a shark will bite once and just leave. It'll just leave you alone. So uh, they were dead wrong on that. They were dead wrong on some other things. They used that, that hyperbole, like, uh, you know, called them monsters and beasts. And you only get that now with some of these online, you know, Sun, the UK Sun, the Mirror, the Daily, Mir Daily Mail. Some of those who use some of that hyperbole when talking about the sharks. But mo for the most part, it's gone. But I think what happened, as far as the endangered, was that that was the marine biology as a whole doing a 180, having a, basically a, a reflex from what they were telling people about them prior. And they felt a little bit of guilt talking about a shark that they knew absolutely zero about at the time. They knew nothing about these sharks back in the 60s and the 70s. They knew nothing. So they acted like they did and they tell you they're beasts and that you would die and that it would, they're out for blood. Once they hear blood, they turn into these monsters. Well, none of it's true. So I still don't think that they know much more about the sharks that we look into than they did back then, because most of them look into these smaller sharks. Um, another thing is I looked into, uh, somebody had asked about deterrence. I had came across a TED talk that had the striped outfit for the surfers and a striped board. And you know, I remember back in like the eighties, that stuff failing, that, that it didn't work that it worked with small sharks, but large sharks are not afraid of sea snakes. So it isn't gonna help you with what you need to worry about. I mean, just because it's effective with some sharks doesn't mean it's effective with the ones you need it to be effective with. It's best to tell the people, hey, look, you know, you guys go out into the water. I don't care if you're going out there to swim, to surf, to do kayak, whatever, at your own risk. I mean, there's risk out there. Just because they don't know of it doesn't mean that, you know, doesn't mean it isn't there and doesn't mean that they shouldn't be told. Um, a lot of people have issues. I get these people taking issues. Oh, I'm going to make the people hate the sharks. No, I'm not. I'm going to make the people know what sharks do. That's what I'm here to do. Tell them sharks are just being sharks. The people that are making people eventually not like the sharks are the ones out there. They're called marine biologists and they're all over the place saying, oh, no hands. They're testing it out because they don't have hands. Oh, they don't want to do this. They don't want to, they don't eat people. We're not on the menu. Well, they do eat people. We are on the menu. Um, when's the last time you went into a restaurant and ate something that's not on the menu? Uh, I would say never, but somehow these marine biologists, they go out to eat and they're eating stuff that's off the menu. They're just eating whatever they want whenever they go out. Menu doesn't matter to them. 
Um, but everybody I know eats off the menu. And if you're eating something in the restaurant, it's probably from the menu. Uh, so we are on the menu. We're not a food source. So them saying we're not on the menu just shows me that they they just without any backing, just like attacks, you know, when's the last time you've heard an example, one example of a similar attack proving their mistaken identity method. They, they don't have them because it's few and far between in large sharks to find mistaken identity. I'll guarantee you that. Even the ones that are in the low visibility water, I don't even think those are mistaken identity because I, I back then thought that. But what I'm seeing now when I look back at these attacks that are in the really, you know, three, four foot visibility is a, that's the ones where the great white just grabs the guy. So it's a test bite. So the shark's there. It's right on you. It knows what you are now. It decided to test you out. It, sometimes it goes through with it. Sometimes it doesn't. But it doesn't mean that that was mistaken identity because visibility was low. The, the, the attack is different in low visibility is what I believe, especially from a great white. It's going to be much more, you know, they're, they're a cautious animal anyway. If they can't see you clearly, I'm sure they're going to be cautious about what they go through. And testing the shark suit, um, they put bait inside of something and they put like a black cover on the one and put the stripes on the other. And this is, you know, they're saying that it's promising but not conclusive yet. But they put that in the water and the shark will grab that one. And I think it's a great white that they're testing with, but the shark will grab the, the bag without the stripes in 90 seconds. Boom, 90 seconds it, it grabs and starts eating that bait. But that other bait bag with the white stripes on it, oh, that thing doesn't get touched till five minutes from there. So there's a delay there, I think, with a shark that's already seen this people baiting bags and throwing them out to them all the time, seeing the normal bag over there and going after it, and then seeing this different bag that's got these stripes on it that they never see when they're getting baited like that, and they're wondering what it is. I think they're smart enough to know that they should be cautious of that. Uh, you know, 90 seconds to five minutes, that's three and a half minutes. So you let me sit there and be scared for three and a half minutes. Uh, longer before it decides whether it's going to bite me or not. I, that's not effective to me and I wouldn't trust it. Um, I also think that this failed in the 80s, like I said. I remember reading about that and sea snakes just aren't going to cut it. So I don't think those boards are going to do anything. Um, you know, they'll stay effective for a while because shark attacks are spread out. and uh, But eventually one of them will be bit, bitten. Um, I also looked into the shark shield and that was interesting because it sends out that field and it's a, it's a pretty big field of electric pulse behind the individual as they're swimming. The problem is it's from behind them. What if the shark's coming up to the side? And the second thing is, is that's not going to stop any great white that's charging you from behind. It's not going to deter it. I don't, I, not unless it's bad enough voltage to hurt other marine animals too because <laughs> those things are coming at you fast and like that guy we just had that just got shot that shark in the head with the with the spear just before it got to him it still knocked him clear out of the water just the momentum of that fish coming at you so i jeez i don't know barring one of those cages abalone dive cages and i wouldn't want to be in one of those either i wouldn't want to be in any cage but uh you know, those things seem to be what I would consider to be okay. Uh, I'm probably safe from a shark being able to bite me and kill me here. It might be able to take my legs from back there, but it ain't going to take my midsection or anything like that. So um, I'm just now starting to look into these new deterrents they have. I've looked into shark bands. Uh, shark Shield seems to make fun of shark bands because they're using magnetics instead of the electronics. Um, but I don't, I don't see that you know a shark ban is going to be uh, very effective as far as you know keeping a shark from biting you. You're just gonna, how far out is that magnet going to matter? So I have to look into that one further. So I wanted to tell you I started looking into that, and we're going to get into that pretty soon. But we're going to finish out the show, and we're going to talk about Mr. Thomas Harrison. And this was over in uh, what was this? Thomas Harrington, and this was at Manly Beach, which is in Australia. This happened in 1916, and Thomas Harrison, he was at the beach, and he was telling this American woman, Beatrice Harrington, or Beatrice, 
Richards. He was telling her how, you know, there's sharks in that water and no woman would dare go in that water as he was going out to swim. Well, she wasn't about to lose a dare, so she went out to swim with them and they're out there swimming and suddenly uh, Mr. Harrington screaming, he's attacked by a shark. Now, Beatrice, she starts swimming to shore as fast as she can. The shark chases her all the way into shore. Uh, she gets into shore. They send a search out. They can never find a, a single thing of Mr. Thomas Harrison. So, uh, you know, he, he won his dare by getting her in the water, but he lost his life by being in the water. And she ended up taking a flight or taking a, a train ride or however she got home. Uh, straight home right after that. She was so distraught by what had happened. Uh, so there's, you know, a man trying to go to a woman into being as dumb as a man and almost worked. Almost got both of them, but it only got one. So Thomas Harrison, he won his bet and he loses his life and, and you know, uh, it's not good. Stay out of those waters. I, I wouldn't be in that water if you paid me. So um, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you need any merch, you can get it right now. If you're in the U.S. territories, you can get it on www.sharkshappen.com. For my other folks, um, hopefully I'll have some progress going on tonight, uh, but we'll have to see. And, you know, I'll be back again tomorrow with another show of attacks. And until then, if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of those sharks than they are of you.